July 16, 1969, was the day mankind first set foot on the moon. It's no wonder so many people who live to see this event consider it humanity's greatest accomplishment. Hideo Kojima would have just been six years old at the time, and like many kids, he grew up wanting to be an astronaut, but only if he couldn't grow up to be a famous movie director first. And if he couldn't be either, he'd be a detective, solving murder cases in L.A. But as we all know, he turned out to be none of these. Instead, he made Police Knots. Police Knots is a 1994 visual novel adventure game published by Konami and released only in Japan. It uses a first-person point-and-click interface, a mixture of text dialogue with voice acting, and anime-style art and video to tell a story that, uh, superficially resembles Lethal Weapon. But in space! It was directed by one of the most famous game developers in history. There's frequent referencing in the Metal Gear Solid games about it, and it was never released outside of Japan. So for the longest time, this game has had a huge, forbidden fruit kind of appeal to it. But in 2009, fans translated the game and made a fully-fledged localization of it for free. And kudos to them, this is the most legitimate-sounding fan translation I have ever played. Except for one specific reference, the game is easily readable, the subtitles are perfectly in sync, and every line isn't just straight-up translated, it's also reinterpreted to just make sense in English. It really is more of a fan localization than a fan translation. But the earnest effort of those fans, and the famous name attached to this game, don't mean it's a masterpiece. It's garnered a huge cult following, but sadly I don't think I'm going to be drinking their Kool-Aid anytime soon. But in order to really explain why, I'm going to have to spoil it a bit. An announcement from beyond the fourth wall begins the show. Jonathan Ingram, our protagonist, is one of the five police knots, the first astronaut trained police force assembled to keep the peace on mankind's first space colony. While testing a new piece of equipment, an accident detaches him from home and launches him deep into space, where a life support module keeps him living in suspended animation for 25 years, until he's finally rescued. We play as Jonathan years later, when he's working as a jaded private eye. The first interactive screen in the game does so much to explain just about all of the backstory you need to know about him, his family, the other police knots, and even the world around them, and what's been happening in the years since his accident. When clicking around his desk and the newspaper clippings on the wall, you can see how life has gone on without him. The police knots all have different jobs now, unrelated to their past. His former wife has found a new man and raised a new child with him. It efficiently frames all of the themes that follow the entire rest of the story. This is a game with a cast of mostly middle-aged characters who fawn over their past glories while panicking over problems that were decades in the making. And Jonathan's an outsider, an artifact from the past. On his desk are beer cans made out of plastic and cigarettes that burn with chemicals rather than smoke. It's the little things that foreshadow this world's problems, the stuff that's easy to forget about. The science fiction of Police Nuts is glamorous, but it's not soft. Kojima's obsessive attention to detail spends thousands of words theorizing what living in deep space would do to the human body over long terms. Radiation here isn't green goop that kills you in seconds. It's an invisible occupational hazard whose effects aren't seen for decades or even generations. The lack of gravity, of solid ground, or even of a regular daylight cycle all contribute to medical problems that these characters sure do love taking their sweet time explaining. It is Kojima, after all, and if there's one example of how drastically his skills at characterization, world building, and plot development collide with the sheer inefficiency of his writing, it's Police Knots. And that's sad, because the characters in the setup here are so easy to empathize with. The game's got a real knack for exploring awkward family situations and irrational frustrations. Jonathan begins the game with a visit from his old flame. His ex-wife comes into the office with a case. Her new husband has gone missing, and she feels her old husband is the only reliable person she can come to. It's, uh, it's pretty awkward. Soon enough, though, their reunion is interrupted by a would-be assassin in what should be a fast-paced chase scene. But one short shooting sequence later, and the pacing just drops dead as you click through hundreds of words of flavor text just wondering which one is the right one you need to hit to keep this thrilling scene progressing. And that's the big issue here. Since the world building is done through text, Kojima has no real time limit here for how long he has to cap his word count. I am incredibly grateful that only a minority of the lines are voiced, because otherwise, we'd be stuck here forever. 
It's got a real fetish for acronyms and pseudoscientific techno babble. Everyone has everything to say about anything. You can click on just a couch and hear this meticulous explanation about how it's actually a super fancy chaos space couch with sleep sensors wired to the room and individually tuned to the couch user. It's ridiculous. No one in real life talks like this. It just pulls you right out of the world and reminds you that it's conservatively translated Japanese sci-fi from the 90s. The technological marvels we enjoy in real life are mundane to us. They're ordinary, but the people in police knots won't shut up about them. I have no idea how this piece of plastic can turn into a computer, and I've never really had a reason to care. But if I was a police knots character, I'd be able to tell you in no less than 400 words. There's a scene where you're defusing a bomb that had me on my toes. There's an incredible amount of tension thanks to the constant ticking of the timer and the slow pace of the puzzles you have to solve. It was driving me nuts, but not because of that tension but because no one would shut up about it and let the scene go on. Every last wire you cut, every time you do anything, all the action stops on a dime. You read for minutes at a time while the timer is supposed to be counting down seconds in the background. And if you mess up, you gotta read through it all, all over again. Jima-san, try the game over screens are hilarious, by the way. The fan translation did an excellent job maintaining the humor and the grit of the original script, which, uh, it also means it maintains some of, um, l let's call them cultural differences. If you ever wondered why this game didn't get a Western release, check this out. The breasts of damn near every single woman in this game are their own interactive objects, with their own flavor text and conversation trees attached, many of which lead to your guy grabbing those breasts usually without permission and with protest. And that level of fan servicing to that degree doesn't just ruin the mood of this hard sci-fi that otherwise takes itself fairly seriously, it also screws with the world building and also what social norms are supposed to be considered acceptable in this fiction. Because the women are surprisingly placid about having their boobs randomly examined by a stranger who just walked in the workplace while they were clocked in. Your partner keeps telling you about what a horrible pervert you are and how you should feel ashamed, but the women in question have a surprisingly non-violent conversation about the minute little scientific details behind their space boobs. <laughs> it's weird. It gets, uh, it gets really darn weird. But let's not ignore the real elephant in the room here. The fact that even boobs are not saved from Kojima filler text. There's so much of it in this game, and the first half of the story moves so slowly that I was honestly just bored with it most of the time. But the pace quickens in the second half, and uh, that's also when some really strange plot holes begin to show up. Spoiler alert. You follow the clues left behind by your ex-wife's husband to the space colony where they lived. You gather up evidence, run it through forensics, you interrogate suspects and witnesses, including your wife's daughter, and gradually this murder mystery escalates into a conspiracy bigger than anyone could have imagined. Even the police are being controlled by shadowy, unseen villains who you gradually discover. But before your character can blow the lid wide open, he's framed by the cops and thrown in the paddy wagon. And on their way to the prison, a uh, new van somehow manages to hijack this heavily armored prison transport vehicle. They break you out and they make it look like a traffic accident. A whole lot of the first half is spent characterizing the police and the corporation on this colony as over-equipped military factions with overpowering surveillance. But you end up getting away with a lot of shit once the tables are turned. In the beginning, there's a lot of time spent talking about how hard it would be to smuggle bodies on or off this colony, but later on you escape to the moon and then you come back by stowing away on a cargo shipment and no one notices? No, no one inspects the shipments that, that doesn't set off any scanners or sensors that are supposed to be everywhere? These are wanted fugitives who are supposed to be in hiding and they just come and go with no problem. Also, Jonathan's ex-wife has a daughter on the colony who keeps him safe during all this, and uh, and she kind of starts taking a liking to him, and one thing leads to another, and no, 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 no! So, that's That's for sure. After all hope is lost and all options are extinguished, Jonathan loads up his gun for some Max Payne-style vigilante justice, where you shoot your way to the top of the evil corporation's tower. 
I love this part. It's ridiculous. Almost 40 guys peek out from cover at once and lay down the DPS real hard, and then they just pop up one or two at a time and get shot down one or two at a time. These are AP police, by the way. They're supposed to be heavily armored super cops that use giant fighting robots and full body armor to fight crime, but our hero here, who's just one guy wearing a coat and a button up, he manages to gun them all down with just his pistol. It's ridiculous! This light gun shooting gallery game is worth mentioning too. Besides this, you've got a cursor that activates a list of verbs, and those are about all the gameplay features we've got here. A couple of white frames, a yellow muzzle flash, and a bullet hole signify a shot, and sometimes a very, very faint blue glow signifies a hit and other times nothing at all does. There's a real lack of visual feedback here. A lot of enemies just do not react to getting shot at all, and it's really hard to tell whether or not you're dealing any damage, which becomes an issue for quite a few of these shooting segments. That's just one of many reasons why I wasn't feeling the magic with this game. It's a shame, because Police Knots has heart and soul to it. I wanted to like it, but for so many reasons, this game just wasn't for me. Thankfully, though, it wasn't totally a lost cause. In a 1996 interview, Kojima said that he was aiming to have his feelings reach the player through these games, to ask questions that other science fiction had yet to. And in that respect, this game didn't completely fail on me. 21 years later, Police Knots is still an interesting story. The problems it explores are deliberately made to be unconventional and less urgent than the norm. You don't save the world from impending doom at the end of this game. Instead, your character simply makes these people more aware of their own problems by exposing a villain whose motives are just as complex and relatable as any great Metal Gear villain. But ultimately, the process of getting there felt so slow and grating to me that now I feel like I kind of understand Konami's decision to keep the game from the West. It's not a bad story, but there's a lot that just gets lost in translation. The official explanation is that they were unable to sync up English dialogue to the FMVs, but really, I think it had more to do with the sheer quality of the Japanese voice acting and this script that would have had to have been drastically reworked to avoid controversy in the West. And maybe, when considering all the changes they'd have to make, Kojima just thought it was too much of his baby to chop it up like that. Also, there's the whole issue of whether or not our heroes here look enough like the cops in Lethal Weapon to avoid a lawsuit, which was actually a big problem when Snatcher got localized. But hey, at least that game turned out fine. In fact, I want to say that if you're interested in checking out a Kojima game that isn't Metal Gear, Snatcher might actually be a better bet. I remember having a blast with that game. I feel like its dazzling pixel art holds up better than the dated anime look of Police Knots. The weirder, perverted bits are relegated to two or three scenes, and they're kind of easy to miss, rather than being a constant force spread over the whole game. And strangely, I think I prefer the faster, snappier pace of its gunplay. It looks more awkward than Police Knots, but in the end, it just feels more satisfying and controllable. Police Knots may be a hidden gem. It may be worth your time exploring it just for curiosity's sake, but I have a hard time believing it's any kind of masterpiece, or even one of Kojima's better games. Not everything of his has to be great, after all. And after going through it from beginning to end, I feel like Police Knots just might have been more quickly forgotten if it was made by anybody else.